Yeah, when Drew earlier said it's bright out here, I wasn't believing him, <laughs> but now I do. <laughs> uh, so um, what I'm going to talk about is um, disaggregated infrastructure and how optical I.O. fits in, in, in there. Um, when I saw the subject of this track, uh, it said in-server connectivity, and I said, what's the server these days? And <laughs> um, so the server, you can draw the boundary uh, almost arbitrarily and call it a server these days. So uh, is it one chassis? Is it one node? Is it uh, one socket? Uh, is it a rack? And so on and so forth. And actually, I think optical I.O. can even further blur that uh, distinction or that boundary. Uh, if you look at sort of the trends, really, you'll see the need for larger clusters. A and today, it is heterogeneous. There is CPUs, GPUs, or accelerators. And then there's memory that is attached. Uh, and then all these are interconnected. Uh, so the, the multicolored boxes, uh, rectangles, are meant to represent sort of accelerators or GPUs. And then the circles behind them perhaps our CPUs. And it doesn't have to be one one to one, by the way, it could be uh, two CPUs for every eight GPUs perhaps. Um, so there are different partitions, different uh, topologies that are possible. And then all of these get interlinked. Now, uh, the traditional way was with the top of the rack and with the NIC in between, but lots of people have talked about uh, the back-end network, the front-end network, and so on and so forth. So this is more of a back-end network, I guess, view. Um, and how do we create these thousands of XPUs cluster, right? So that's the place where, and, and disaggregated. So all these elements, the compute elements, the memory elements, uh, if they are to be really disaggregated, and when I say disaggregated, uh, they can sit in different chassis within a rack. Um, or maybe even across racks, uh, potentially. Uh, so you need terabytes per second um, to support inter-node or inter-XPU connectivity at that point, and, and the switching elements uh, will need tens of terabytes per second of aggregate throughput to make it all possible. So, and then you can add another layer uh, called memory, and the memory can be in the form of DRAM um, pools, or perhaps HBM uh, pools, if that's a thing. Um, those are in that yellow boxes to the left of that uh, big box there. Um, and you know you could have shared memory or pooled memory. Um, and again, those links that go between the compute elements, compute boxes, and the a memory pool, or maybe it's individual memory boxes, uh, that also need lots of throughput, uh, low latency, uh, high reliability, and, and very good bit error rates. Uh, so how do we get there? And, and really, um, optical I.O., which is in the form of a chiplet that sits inside uh, chips, right? So it's integrated into the package. Um, a GPU or a memory controller, perhaps, uh, and directly talks optics uh, to the other chip, really. So it's chip to chip, optical interconnect, is how we want to uh, propose we solve this problem. Um, so, and, and really, if you look at the use cases, applications, and, and capabilities, um, very efficient memory semantic fabrics. So you want to be able to have uh, load store commands uh, that the, as the basis for uh, interconnections. Uh, and then you want to be able to drive scale out. Now, uh, you know the, the distinction between scale up and scale out is also uh, uh, blurring a bit. Um, so. How do we, what are the requirements for making that, all that possible? It's multi terabits per bytes per second connectivity, uh, power efficiency. Uh, I think uh, Drew talked about less than four picojoules per bit. 
Um, bandwidth density, um, HBM disaggregation was one of the use cases there, which talks about having two terabytes per second um, within, I think the HBM edge is 11 millimeters. So can we do 11 millimeters and two terabytes, which is 16 terabits per second? Um, and um, in terms of the use cases, what I listed there is node-to-node -node connectivity, like GPU to GPU, or CXL resource disaggregation, um, and then HBM disaggregation slash expansion. Uh, so all these require those capabilities, and, and how do we, um, what are some of the things we can do to get there, right? So our uh, proposal is, I'll start from the right, uh, is in-package integration of, of an optical engine or an optical chiplet, right? So that is actually a, a real package uh, with a compute a die in the middle, and four of our chiplets around it. Uh, so the chiplets each can offer uh, terabits per second of throughput. Um, and uh, the picture of the die in the middle basically supports up to eight, um, eight ports. And, and each port can offer some amount of bandwidth, hundreds of gigabits per second today. And, and that can be scaled up. And it's based on a micro ring architecture, a micro ring modulator. Um, and what we use is a multi-wavelength uh, methodology to carry today eight wavelengths per port. Um, so, and if you look at, maybe I'll go to the next slide here. Um, so focusing on the top picture for a second, uh, each port can carry a certain number of wavelengths. Uh, so the picture shows four, but what we are demonstrating today is eight wavelengths per port, and each chiplet has eight ports in it. Um, and if you look at the first row of the table, uh, if you have eight ports in a chiplet and eight wavelengths per port, uh, and uh, each wavelength is carrying 32 gigabits per second, that all multiplies up to two terabits per second in each direction, uh, which is uh, four terabits per second in uh, TX plus RX, uh, the way some of the AI ML guys like to count it, and um, which, which is half a terabyte per second. Uh, we have a couple of vectors in which we can, can scale this solution, uh, and that's where the scalability of the uh, connectivity comes in. Uh, we can increase the number of ports per chiplet. Uh, we can go up to 16 ports, uh, for example. Uh, we can increase the number of wavelengths per port, uh, go from eight wavelengths today to 16. Uh, we can increase the signaling rate uh, per wavelength uh, today from 32 to 64 in the future. Uh, and in fact, you can integrate, like you saw in the picture, uh, you know, in the package picture, uh, you can integrate multiple chiplets on the same package. So you could have four chiplets, for example, surrounding a compute die. Uh, so even within a chiplet, we have a nice uh, way to scale up the capabilities, the throughput. Um, with, within the same footprint, by the way, it's, it's a, it's a sub-11 millimeter chiplet today. It's somewhere in that order. And, um, and within that same chiplet, we can scale the throughput, uh, is the point, up to as much as 32 gigabits per second, which is four terabytes per second, or two terabytes per second in each direction, uh, which, uh, which is where uh, seems like one of the very demanding use case is, the HBM disaggregation use case. Um, in addition to that, there is another aspect, which is radix, um, which is how many places can you go from one, one source or one, uh, one GPU? Let's say you want to uh, connect to eight uh, memory pools. Uh, you could do that with an with eight-port device. And maybe in the future, with a 16-port device, you can go 16 places. Uh, you can split up the bandwidth, the throughput, 
16 ways and go to 16 different places. Uh, so this is all to say that we do have a path, a scalable path, uh, to offer a very efficient, uh, low latency, high bandwidth density solution uh, that, that carries us into the future. So looking at some of the architectural parameters, um, and uh, by the way, the picture on the top right corner is actually a, a, a full representation of the chiplet die. And you'll notice that we have um, eight fiber ports laid out, and it's a fully retimed kind of solution. Uh, so we, and actually when Jeff was showing his uh, table with three rows, retimed versus no DSP versus, uh, I think the third row was, uh, sorry? Co-package. Co I think we check all three boxes, actually. <laughs> so, so we get the benefits of all three rows <laughs> in your table. Uh, so, so I think that's the, I mean, there are, it's not to say that there are some things to figure out uh, in terms of co-packaging, uh, yields, and things like that. Uh, but really, if you look at uh, the lengths per host uh, parameter, uh, we can scale up uh, from 16 or more lengths to hundreds of lengths. If you think about if each chiplet can do 16 lengths or 16 ports, and you put four or six of chip six chiplets in a package, you can go up there to as 100 lengths, perhaps, per package. Um, in terms of the host interface, uh, what we are targeting is a wide parallel interface-based solution, uh, something like a BOW or a UCIE. Uh, UCIE spec, for example, calls out uh, half a picojoule per bit per second uh, per their spec. Um, and uh, half a picojoule per bit, uh, and by the way, that includes the host and the chiplet, and I'm, I wasn't sure Mike meant just the host or <laughs> the host and the chiplet. But, um, uh, and then in terms of uh, retimed versus unretimed, we are doing retimed. Uh, so it is gonna be, uh, the, the link budget is gonna be, accountability is gonna be there, and uh, we can sort of, uh, you know, deal with all the PCIe um, quirks, uh, maybe we call them. Um, and then the FEC requirements. So right now the solution we are using uses 32 gig NRZ signaling on the optics uh, per wavelength. Um, you know, fundamentally, uh, I think Chris will agree with me when I say that uh, why go to PAM4 and all this complexity on the optics side <laughs> uh, when there's so much bandwidth that is available. Uh, so we use lots of wavelengths and uh, use simple modulation. Uh, and that's how we get the throughput, uh, lots of throughput and lots of throughput density. Uh, and no FEC, right? So latency is important for a lot of these things. Uh, so we don't need any FEC uh, to deal with the optical uh, con connectivity. Uh, and UCIE doesn't have the need for a lot of uh, error correction either. There is some retry mechanism in case although the bitter rates are up there, I mean, very good, uh, 10 to the minus 27 in some cases and 10 to the minus 15 uh, in the worst case. Uh, so, so overall, the bitter rates are gonna be pretty good. Uh, and you can see the block diagram there. Um, so in terms of uh, data rate, I think I discussed that in the table before, it is scalable. Um, you know, 16 gig might be uh, a minimum we like to do, uh, although we can go further down. But at some point, you ask, you should ask the question: uh, I, I Don't you care about throughput? <laughs> and so, you want to have uh, something that's reasonable there. Um, and then the number of lanes per link. I guess um, I was thinking a lane is a wavelength uh, kind of uh, framework. Uh, so. Um, and that scales as well, uh, and um, we can do perhaps um, you know, up to 32 wavelengths per link. You can actually bundle two ports, perhaps, uh, and form a, a protocol link uh, that is carried across two uh, optical fibers, perhaps. 
Um, there are some things we need to think about in terms of DSQ and all this stuff, but that is manageable. Um, aggregate bandwidth uh, per link, actually this is one of the biggest um, you know, benefit or selling points, I guess, with the optical I.O. solution. We can scale all the way up to terabytes per second uh, with the XPU to memory uh, or switch to switch uh, kind of interconnect. Um, and we can also have pretty high uh, radix and, and keep the per link bandwidth low as well. Although again, if you go too low, then you start to question, is all the headache worth it, right? Um, linear bandwidth density, again, uh, is, 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 a, is a big focus for the solution. Uh, one of the things is, we in the chiplet realm, uh, we are obviously in the millimeter uh, world, and the die sizes can be so big. Uh, and so we are talking about millimeters and, and escaping uh, terabytes per second through these some number of single digit millimeter uh, shoreline. Uh, so, so we are pretty good there. Um, energy efficiency uh, in a single direction. So this is one where there's a lot of uh, variability and, and you know, obviously the laser, how, how many ports you drive with one laser. Uh, and by the way, we use an external laser. I think that is one of the items there. Um, and we, can, we have a line of sight to driving lots of uh, ports with a single laser, for example. Today we, we drive eight ports with one laser. Um, so so I, I, I couldn't come up with a single number, but what I'm saying there is um, we're gonna be in the few picojoules per bit, sub five picojoules per bit for, for sure is, is, uh, is our uh, target there. Um, I think the rest of the items are pretty much covered with the few picojoules per bit uh, statement there. Uh, in terms of reach, um, our focus is to really look at, um, you know, within the rack and maybe rack to rack. So 30 meters is really the kind of number we try to target, but really with, uh, with uh, optical fiber, single mode fiber, uh, there's not a hard limit at 30 meters, so we can go up to 100 meters. Uh, and latency is in the realm of single digit nanoseconds per side, so maybe it adds up to close to 10 nanoseconds uh, when you add them up on the both sides, Rx plus Tx. And uh, the time of flight, of course, is uh, something we can't do much about. Uh, and bitter rates, uh, again, we don't have an FEC requirement. Uh, without an FEC, we do 10 to the minus 12 today. That's what we are demonstrating. Uh, now, there is always some trade-offs we can make. We can, uh, you know, reduce the bitter rate requirement a little bit and, uh, you know, trade that for some extra margin, perhaps. Uh, or, uh, and, and our model is to have up to four connectors in the, uh, in the link. Uh, and, and maybe there is, uh, you know, different types of connectors that may make sense uh, as well. People talking about uh, glass, um, uh, you know, uh, some kind of uh, uh, PCB replaced with some kind of a glass interposer or something like that. And all those, uh, we could look at what the losses are there and see how we can trade things off uh, in different ways. Um, in terms of uh, the optical fiber, uh, we are marching towards. I mean, we are We are marching towards single mode fiber. Basically, uh, there are some solutions today that in our demo, which some parts of the demo which use PM fiber, but but we are marching towards single mode fiber. Uh, optical connectors. I talked about that for connectors. Uh, and one of the important ones is the max operating temperature. Uh, our spec is 110 C for the chiplet. A junction, so it is pretty much the same as any CPU, GPU kind of thing. Uh, so we tolerate uh, all the way up to 110 C kind of temperatures in the package, in the chiplet. Uh, the laser is external, and, and that's gonna be cooled uh, in a different way. Uh, and we, don't, we do not want to do liquid cooling with our solution. So um, 
I think the call to action is really uh, let's all uh, work together to standardize some of these form factors, connectors, fiber management solutions. Uh, at the end of the day, there's a lot of different approaches uh, that uh, folks uh, bring to the table. Uh, and uh, if we can sort of standardize on some of the external pieces, uh, then we can all work towards uh, you know, a solution that, that works. Uh, and packaging and test methods are, are the other piece that uh, we look forward to. And uh, please come by uh, the Intel booth where we have an FPGA um, MCP. So that MCP has an FPGA die inside and two of our optical I.O. chiplets. And we have been showing a demonstration between two of those FPGA MCPs, uh, you know, transferring two terabits per second between the two MCPs. Uh, that little card there, the blue card, uh, which is a PCIe form factor card, uh, between those two, uh, we can show two terabits in each direction uh, kind of uh, demonstration. Any questions, quick ones? Uh, I don't know how much time I have, but. I think we're a little tight. Okay. Let's thank the speaker.